So it's my pleasure to be here. This is maybe the fifth time I've given this series of lectures. It's essentially the one quarter course I give on laser diagnostics at Stanford from 27 lectures down to 15. So the pace is a little fast, uh, but hopefully the materials that you'll get allow you to, to think and, and look at things more slowly. I know sometimes I go a little too fast in these lectures. So my take on laser diagnostics is to try to do something that's practical and will yield good results. So I'm not so interested in ex pushing the boundaries of something that doesn't work, but something that will really have impact, particularly on combustion chemistry and propulsion systems. So I'm really going to cover what I'll call three things. There's the underlying science of laser diagnostics, which is called spectroscopy. And then I'm going to focus on two particular diagnostic methods, laser absorption and laser-induced fluorescence. There are many techniques, but these two are particularly powerful and uh, have quantitative applications. And I'm going to use a variety of different example applications, ranging from engines to shock tubes and kinetics. I come from Stanford University. This is a picture of our campus here in California, just south of San Francisco. Home of the Bay Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge in, uh, in San Francisco. Now, this is lecture one. There's 15 lectures. In lecture one, I'm going to begin with what I'll call an overview, and then we'll begin to deal with the real material and the introductory material. In general, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce you to the fundamentals of molecular spectroscopy, dealing mostly with molecules rather than atoms. I'm going to emphasize laser absorption and laser induced fluorescence. And I'm going to use the shock tube as a primary tool for studying combustion because the shock tube is a way to produce very controlled samples of, of gas at uh, known temperatures and pressures. And then I'm going to give you a variety of different examples. Uh, one would be multi-parameter sensing in certain propulsion flows and engines. When we do kinetics, we're interested in measuring species, time histories, and then I'm going to spend some time on planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging and high-speed flows. Okay, so what is spectroscopy? By spectroscopy, we're talking about the interaction of radiation, light, in, with matter, in our case, gases. So whether it's the emission of light from the gases or the absorption of light, why is it that these gases uh, uh, selectively interact with radiation at certain frequencies? Here's a couple of examples. This is, a, this is an infrared example. This is a plot of the fractional transmission of light, monochromatic light, tuned in wavelength across the frequency range. Now, when we work in the infrared, we deal with frequency units, which is one over lambda. So this is four microns right here, four microns of wavelength. It's 2,500 wave numbers. As we imagine scanning our monochromatic source in wavelength, we would find selective dips in the transmission, namely we would have absorption. This is a molecule called HBr, hydrogen bromide, with a particular length and particular temperature and a particular pressure. So what we see is a pattern of features and we all learned that these are parts of, of a band. And these individual features are called lines, and they appear to be very sharp. And, and until the laser came around, it was really hard to actually unravel these and see that they actually have shapes. So that down here in the bottom, you would see if we blow up the frequency range that we actually can map out the character of any one of these features. In this case, it's nitric oxide, different gas, 600 degrees Kelvin. The point being that these lines, sometimes called transitions, have shape. And we can use that information to our advantage now that we have lasers in order to make quantitative measurements. So it's the shape and the amplitude of these features that we deal with in trying to quantify the uh, gas that we're probing. So why would we want to use lasers? The virtue of the laser, of course, is that it enables diagnostic methods. Because they're monochromatic, coherent light, you can propagate the light uh, in a tight focus beam. And because it's monochromatic, we can simplify the physics. This might be used for fluorescence, Raman, laser-induced incandescence. Might also be used for particle imaging, velocimetry, cars, and so on. But I'm going to focus on just these two examples, which are known as linear methods. The linear methods are simpler to interpret uh, and to learn from. Well, you might ask, why else do we care about lasers? Well, they can allow us to do very sensitive and quantitative probing. So on the left, we have here a plot. You might not be able to read it, but this is the detection limit in parts per million versus temperature for a variety of different, uh, I'll call these large molecules. They're not diatomic molecules. This right-hand plot is diatomic. I hope you can read this. The bottom line is that for the prescribed uh, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, path length, and uh, time response, one megahertz, we can detect subpart per million of some of these diatomic molecules, and typically tens to maybe 100 parts per million of the molecules, the larger molecules. <coughs> 
So that's why we care. It's a very sensitive way of detecting species. Now, in the way of introduction, I want to show some examples of how you use lasers in what I'll call energy sciences. Might be remote sensing, might be combustion, propulsion, process control, energy system. The underlying physics is exactly the same, it's just that the applications vary. Things we might be interested in measuring would be species concentrations, temperature, pressure, density, velocity, mass flux, properties that combustion and propulsion scientists or engineers would care about. This is an example from 1986. So the method called planar laser-induced fluorescence was born in my laboratory in 1981, a long time ago. Uh, and this was the first, one of the very first uh, uh, images of OH, the hydroxyl radical, in a spray flame. One of my students, he's a vice president at a company in Boston. We've taken these techniques on the road to large-scale coal gasifiers, uh, swirl burners that simulate properties of gas turbine combustors, uh, coal-fired power plants. So some of the methods that I'm going to tell you about are very portable. We, I call them field deployable. We put them in a suitcase, take them on the road. Other methods are very difficult to move. They might fit on an optical table eight feet long. They're not very portable. But some of the methods we use are extremely useful for practical applications. Here's a large-scale industrial refinery system. <coughs> incinerator. So basically, the techniques I'm telling you about have potential for not only laboratory, but in the field. I call this field optical diagnostics, and we can think of it as really being at the intersection of, say, three different applications. We might be interested in characterizing a test facility. This is, the, uh, this is a ground test facility for scramjet testing at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. So this is a ground test of something that relates to the scramjet design that they're interested in. So sometimes you just want to understand this facility. How is it behaving? Is it approaching the conditions that you need? Or maybe we're looking at something really complicated, like this uh, rocket exhaust from a Titan IV at Aerojet in California. We're just trying to understand uh, a complex reactive environment that we may not understand. Here's another one from Pratt & Whitney, pulse detonation engine in the desert in California. We're just trying to understand how is this system working? But then there's times when we're trying to do quantitative model validation or simulations. Here's an example of a imaging of a hydrogen jet. Here's the hydrogen jet in a supersonic cross flow. And you'll see the mixing of the fuel and the temperature. So there's a case where we're striving to do an experiment with quantitative data that could be used for model validation. Or we might do something in an IC engine where we might have one of d several different colors of laser light propagated by fiber into different parts of an engine. So this is an example where we're really trying to uh, improve the modeling capabilities of these real, of these, of these systems. That point being that the things I'm showing you are applicable to large scale systems such as this rocket exhaust, as well as laboratory science of a very small nature. Now one of the primary tools we use at Stanford because of my interest in chemistry is a shock tube, which is a long tube, usually a constant diameter, separated into two sections of a high pressure section and a low pressure section called driver and driven, because this is the high pressure gas that's used to drive the shock wave. Pressure difference causes the diaphragm to break, shock wave propagates down the tube at some shock speed V sub S, which we measure, and it converts the initial gas conditions of P1 and T1 to some, some post-shock conditions. Now, the unique thing about the Stanford program is that we, over time, we've learned how to measure a lot of different things. The measurements are typically made down here near the end. The instant shock wave reflects off the end and leaves behind a stagnant sample. So we have, for a while, one to maybe 10 or 20 milliseconds, a stagnant sample of gas with precisely known temperature and pressure, precise meaning better than 1%. So this is a, a gas that we probe, and we probe it by several different ways. We might use any one or two of these different types of laser sources, which propagate through this gas that's stagnant. And we use that to probe the time history of perhaps the temperature or perhaps the species concentrations that we're interested in. So in a given experiment, we may only use one or two of these. We may also look at emission of light. And now more recently, in the last few years, we have a transparent end wall. And we look with a high-speed camera to look at this region and try to observe what we call inhomogeneous combustion inhomogeneous ignition. It's undesirable, but this is how we make sure that our experiments are OK. And lately, we've also begun to do post-shock sampling with a gas chromatograph. So after the uh, gas has been heated for a few milliseconds, an expansion wave arrives, cools the gas, 
we can extract a sample and do chemical analysis of those gases. So the virtue of the shock tube is that it's essentially uh, a nearly ideal test platform for a short period of time. Very well-defined temperature and pressure, very well-defined time zero. So when the shock wave passes back by our window, we get a sharp change. That's time zero in the process. And we have clear optical access across this tube, which might be four or five or six inches in diameter. This could be used in many different ways. We might use this measure to measure the ignition delay time, which is the common engineering quantity of interest. We might use it to study the rate constants of elementary reactions, or we might use this to measure time histories of a complex mixture, which could be used to test a large reaction mechanism. And we primarily are interested in measuring the radical species, such as OH or methyl or others, uh, combustion intermediates such as uh, uh, ethylene or formaldehyde or combustion products. So we can use these techniques. We can use these techniques whenever the molecules absorb light. Not all molecules absorb uh, infrared or visible light. Now here's an example. So this is something that we did maybe seven, eight years ago. This is a, an experiment in uh, heptane, uh, diluted heptane, equivalence ratio of one. Diluted means that it's in argon so that we could control the temperature. Modeled with a mechanism called JetSurf 2.0, and these are the time histories. Notice this is the log-log scale. Mole fractions versus time. We start with heptane and oxygen, and we see that within 10 microseconds, most of the heptane has been converted to ethylene. But very quickly, the hydrocarbons break down to intermediates such as ethylene. Ethylene is the dominant one, and it goes away. And we see the radicals, OH comes up, plateaus, goes up. So immediately you see that the combustion process goes through different phases of chemistry. An initiation, an intermediate region, and then finally this is what we would call ignition. So by measuring multiple species over a wide range of time scales, we can begin to examine different phases of the chemistry of hydrocarbon combustion. What would we do if we wanted to make a quantitative determination of the rate constants? We would measure the rate constant for this particular reaction. So if you've had any course in combustion chemistry, this is a reaction which one radical produces two radicals. It's called chain branching. This is generally said to be the most important reaction in combustion chemistry. So you want to know the rate constant for this reaction as well as it can be determined. So over a period of time, my first student did this in 1990, and we came along um, and we did it again in 2010, 2000. So we've done this three times, three different methods, and the fact is that these data of these, three, of these colors here have very low scatter. And what that reveals to me is the virtue of the laser in producing highly quantitative, low scatter results. This is as good as it can be done at the present day. So we can provide high accuracy measurements of these critical rate coefficients. Now in your uh, notes you'll have, I listed a variety of different texts that might be of interest to some of you if you want some background reading. Uh, most recent one is the book that I published with some of my students on spectroscopy, which is really the origin of the things that I'm telling you about today or this week. Uh, here's our schedule. There are three lectures per day. We're in the lecture one, overview and introduction but you can refer to this if you want to see where we're headed. Okay, now we're ready to start the real material. Um, this is a photograph of one of my students. Let's see, he would have graduated around 2000. This is a photograph of a so-called ring dye laser. It's a particular type of laser that we use. One of the key things we have to deal with in spectroscopy is deciding how we're gonna handle quantum mechanics. You can go take a course in quantum mechanics, or two or three. But in fact, if you want to apply the results, you really only need to take away a few rules. And if you'll accept those rules, you can skip the course in quantum mechanics for a while. Underlying here is something called Planck's Law. And we use this to talk about absorption and emission, talk about the Boltzmann distribution, working. So this is what we're going to do now in the remainder of this hour one. So quantum mechanics is the tool that the physicists would use to describe the uh, interaction of gases with uh, electromagnetic radiation. And of course, the key takeaway is that uh, molecules, small systems like atoms and molecules, reside in discrete energy levels. They don't have a continuum of energy distribution. So the so-called internal energy of the atoms and the molecules is prescribed by quantum numbers to describe the quantum states in which these atoms and molecules may, li may live. 
And so if we're thinking about a diatomic molecule, for example, we would describe the potential of interaction between the two nuclei as they, as they oscillate with a potential energy curve. And residing within this potential energy curve would be a family of loud rotational and vibrational energies represented by their quantum numbers. We make a simple model that says that the sum of the internal energy is the sum of that associated with the electrons, the vibrational motion of the nuclei, and the rotation of the nuclei. So here's our simple mechanical model of this diatomic molecule. So we can actually use this mechanical model together with about three results from quantum mechanics to describe everything we need to know. We just have to accept those constraints from quantum mechanics. So you can think of this diatomic molecule as being two uh, heavy nuclei separated by a massless spring so that these nuclei are vibrating as well as rotating about their center of mass. So quantum mechanics uh, tells us the, the allowed energy states and, and defines the quantum um, numbers. But we'll just accept those things. Now the important thing probably would be uh, uh, Planck's law, which we'll come to in a minute. So now you imagine uh, horizontal lines that correspond to different allowed energy levels of the atom or molecule that we're talking about. And certain combinations of these states can talk to each other by the emission or absorption of light. These are called allowed transitions. So there are many, many, many energy levels. But there are simple rules for the ones that can interact with each other by the absorption or emission of light. So the vertical axis is always energy. The horizontal axis is nothing. It's just a, an indicator of the, of the energy. So we have energy, states, or levels. And there's a subtle difference between state and level that I'll get into a little bit later. But if, in fact, we know that these energies of the atoms and molecules are discrete, then the differences between these energy levels, which we honor by conservation of energy, must also be discrete amount of energy, which corresponds to a particular photon energy, and therefore why we have transitions or lines, sharp lines, corresponding to the differences between these energy levels. So the important thing is Planck's law, which is just an expression of the conservation of energy. It says that delta E, the energy of the photon, whether it's absorbed or emitted, is the difference between the upper level and the lower level. We denote the upper level with a single prime, and we denote the lower level with a double prime. So the difference in energy is the difference between the upper and the lower state energies. And Planck's law says that that is equal to H, which is Planck's uh, constant, times the frequency nu in, in, uh, in hertz, which can be also written as uh, hc over lambda if you honor c equals lambda nu, the speed of light, times the wavelength, times the frequency in their usual units of centimeters per second, wavelength of centimeters, and frequency in hertz. So these, this delta E, which we care about, can be written in a variety of different ways. It's just a question of how we express the frequency. We can express it as nu in hertz, we can express it as one over, the one over lambda, or we can express it as nu bar, which is the energy in wave numbers. It's a unit that's common in spectroscopy. So these are all just conservation of energy telling us what the wavelengths will be for particular transitions. Now, small species like nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, CO2, water have what we'll call discrete spectral features, meaning that we can think of them as having these discrete energy levels. Large molecules, like say a fuel molecule, say uh, uh, octane, have so many energy levels that they blend together and we cannot see that discrete structure. We call those blended features. It's important to understand this going back and forth between these different uh, ways of expressing the energy. All right, so let's look at absorption and emission. So the types of spectra that we're dealing with for the most part are absorption, emission, fluorescence, or scattering. Common types of scattering would be Rayleigh scattering and Raman scattering. We'll talk about that later. OK, so, oops, I went too far here. Let's go back. If we're going to do absorption, absorption is governed by something called Beer's law. And so if we have an incident source of light of intensity, and this might be uh, watts per unit area or watts per unit area per unit frequency, there are different expressions for intensity. But incident intensity of I sub zero, passing through a gas of path length L, will have an exit intensity of I sub T, the transmitted intensity. And in this assumed uniform medium, expressed by temperature, pressure, mole fraction, and uh, 
perhaps velocity. We might find that as we scan the laser frequency, we would see these dips in the transmission, which would mean absorption. And then we can try to relate this back to the energy level structure of the molecule. And that Beer Lambert law, which we uh, can derive, it's quite, quite analogous to um, um, kinetic theory, really. There's a simple exponential decay law that says that the transmission will be exponentially decaying with an absorbance alpha, which can be written as the product of the number density of this absorbing species, J, the cross-section sigma, and the path length L. So this quantity now must be dimensionless. And it's really just a case of the, the, the light. The farther the light goes, it will be attenuated on each so-called collision of the photon with molecules. Sometimes in the infrared, we'll use this different system of units, where S is called the line strength. And we'll come back to this later. Pressure, mole fraction, line shape, and length. So there are different ways of expressing this absorbance that goes into this measurement. So a measurement might be made. We might measure IT over I0. And from that, from that, we might be interested in the number density of the species, or we might be interested in the partial the mole fraction. So we use this measurement as, an, as a measurement of the species we're interested in, uh, in monitoring. Or we might be interested in measuring the temperature. There are different ways of using the Beer-Lambert law. The Beer-Lambert law applies only to monochromatic light. Now, spectroscopy uh, can be broken down into different um, elements. I like to break it down into lines, bands, and systems. So back to our diatomic molecule. So this is the potential energy. This potential energy is expressing the energy stored as this molecule is changing length. It's effectively two nuclei bound by a spring. So you're compressing the spring, you're pulling, extending the spring, you're changing the amount of that energy that's stored in the potential of that motion. And this is the boundary. So when you pull the atoms all the way apart, they're dissociated. And this is now the dissociation out here. Underlying this now are the quantum description of the, of the vibrational level shown in dark blue and the uh, fine structure for rotation. So remember, our internal energy is the only thing we care about, and it's the sum of three things. When you see this diagram, that means E electronic is fixed. We're in a particular electronic state. So R is the distance between the nuclei. Upward is energy. And this is now red, is the, is the electronic state we're going to be typically in one electronic state. All right, so we can have transitions then between rotational levels or between combination of rotational and vibrational levels. And we have to, have to, do, we have to learn how to deal with that. And we'll go through that today. Remember now, this individual feature is called a line. That corresponds to a single transition from one quantum state to another. That's a line. But if you look at the spectrum, you would see that they typically fall into groups of lines. And this would now, this combination would be called a band. So the sum of the uh, combined rotational vibrational transitions of a molecule can be formed into a band whenever you have the upper and the lower vibrational levels fixed. All of those lines form a band. And it looks like there's two groups, and there are two groups. Those are called branches. There's the R branch and there's the P branch. And we'll find that there's simple relations for how to calculate or interpret this pattern of, of lines forming bands, given band. When the quantum state, the quantum number for the upper state and the lower are differed by one, that's the, and that's a rule we're going to take away from quantum mechanics, those are the strongest features, and they're the dominant ones. And when those, and when those transitions occur, that's called rho vibrational, which stands for combined rotational and vibrational change. Those transitions typically are in the infrared, beyond where you can see with your eyes. So we can see with our eyes between about 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. These transitions might be in the infrared at, uh, at, at 1 to 10,000 uh, nanometers. So <clears throat> here's our pattern of lines again. So we have some sort of lower state, V, and we have candidate upper states. These red lines correspond to the different vibrational levels. So you go from an initial vibrational level and rotational level to some upper ones. And we'll be able to take from quantum mechanics the rules that tell us which of these are allowed. Remember, a single feature is called a line. 
see this pattern here? That means we're looking at a band, meaning groups of lines with common, with the same upper and lower vibrational levels. And these two components here are the branches. Now, usually, delta V is 1. However, it's possible to have some absorption with delta V of 2, meaning you go from 0. These quantum numbers are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. 0 to 1 would be the strongest. But 0 to 2 is possible. It's just weak. And this pattern down here shows you, by the height of this red region, that the delta V of 1s are quite a bit stronger than the 2s and the 3s. So quantum mechanics will tell us that these are slightly allowed. The terminology is they're allowed, slightly allowed. If the molecule is really harmonic, these are actually even forbidden. So the spectroscopy can be complicated, but there's usually rules that help us interpret this or keep it simple. All right, so remember, components of spectra are lines, bands, and systems. I've told you what a line is, a band is. Now we have to talk about systems. Systems corresponds to the fact that molecules have electron, different electronic states. So we take molecular nitrogen. It would have a variety of possible electronic configurations, meaning that the electrons have rearranged, and as you go from one arrangement to another, they may have higher energy stored. So there's a notation. Spectroscopy is all about notation. It's like an accountant. They have ways of keeping track of things. And so this notation on the right is the notation that spectroscopists use to characterize the specific electronic state that we're dealing with. This one here is called A3 sigma plus. We'll find that the lowest energy level always is denoted by a capital X. And then as we go up, we go from A to B to C. So there's a, there's a method in what looks like a, a terribly complicated problem. These electronic states are widely separated, typically, which means that the spectra will typically be in the visible or the ultraviolet. So spectroscopy tends to either be ultraviolet, visible, infrared. In ultraviolet and visible, we're talking about electronic transitions. and Those are called systems. If we're in the infrared, uh, we're talking about uh, real vibrational transitions, and those are uh, composed of bands. So there's some terminology here that you can read at your, at, your, at your leisure. And then the spectroscopists who study the spectra of nitrogen, for example, they have electric discharge in nitrogen, air, and look at the spectrum. And you'll see that it falls in different spectral regions. And over time, people have given these things names. So for example, the transitions between A and B are called the nitrogen first positive. So just a compact notation for all of the transitions between A and B. And similarly, between B and C is called the second positive. We'll learn more about the symbolism. So there's a lot of symbolism. As long as you just don't get thrown off by it, the symbolism just tells you what states you're dealing with as you work your way towards understanding the spectrum. This is an example from the lab course that I give. This is a case where we, we, we heat air with an electric discharge. And this is now um, emission. We're looking at emission of light as a function of wavelength in the, in the visible. So this is what the spectrometer would see. If we take a box and look at the spectrum from the plasma and spread it out spectrally, spectrally resolved, we would see this. We would see that over a range between 570 and 610 nanometers in the visible, you would see this pattern of, li of lines, which form together in what looked like various bands. And then again, notation, notation, notation. So the, the, uh, and over time, people have learned that the, this particular grouping had corresponds to an upper state vibrational level of 6, and a lower state vibrational level of 2, so that the delta V is 4. So all of these have delta V of 4. Nature has said that for this molecule, which is nitrogen, that it favors delta Vs of 4. We accept it. So there's buried within each of these things, looks like a repetitive structure. And within those are the bands and the lines that we can't see. We can't see them because the resolution is not sufficient, but they're there. So there's lots of notation in spectroscopy. But if you just kind of accept it, it's not that bad. So here's the ultraviolet. So this is now, uh, got a question? Uh, that was uh, post pro Okay, so we record that on a, on a linear CCD array. So it's a handheld, a very small, compact spectrometer. It looks for a tenth of a second or something like that. It charges up the CCD array, and we read it out as voltage. 
voltage versus wavelength. Now, if we were doing this in the ultraviolet, these are, these are now, uh, if you want to get emission, you need it to be hot. How do we get it hot? We burn it or we use electrical discharge, one or the other. So electrical heating, plasma, low pressure plasma, or combustion, you get, get it hot, it emits. If it's cold, it mostly only absorbs. This is a plot now for different types of electric discharges. Coronas, transient spark, low discharge. The point being that if you looked in the ultraviolet, you would see, um, this was, these were DC discharges we did. This would be like a, a, a small diameter bore tube, maybe you know, a tenth of a tor or a tor of gas, and you put, pass current through there and you get emission. And, but spectroscopists would use these things to study this pattern of lines. And from this pattern of lines or bands, they would interpret the allowed energy levels of the atom or molecule. So you, gradually you build an understanding of the energy level structure of an atom or molecule. So the spectroscopists, that's what they care about. They just want to use the spectra to understand the molecules. We want to use the spectroscopy to make measurements in combustion. So we just have to accept that the, uh, the literature that exists. Okay, so there's, and this, the spectra can occur in different regimes. If it's between, <clears throat> say, up to, up to about here, it's called the visible. Beyond that, we call that the near infrared. So there's light, light at all these wavelengths. Okay, now, historically, before we had CCD cameras, uh, people had to record spectra with film. And they had to find a way to disperse the spectrum. So you see with your eyes this bulk integral. You can discriminate color, but you can't really discriminate wavelengths precisely. So boxes have been built, spectrometers of different types, which allow the, the spread of the spectrum. So this is a spread. This is now the OH molecule spread between, it looks like, over maybe 3,000. I can't even quite read the numbers here. Spectral region from around 3,700. In any case, what you'll see are these vertical lines. And this is why the, where the word line came from. The spectrum was distributed, recorded on film with a box that has a vertical slit. And that leads to lines on the film. That's where the word came from. But there are transitions between different quantum states. And the spectrum for OH would be different than that of CH for different electronic transitions. So the CH would have different electronic transitions that we might study, or we might study NH. So each of these molecules has its own unique spectrum. The complication in combustion is that the spectrum may overlap. But if you t put that aside, each of these molecules has a discrete spectrum that's independent of the situation, except that you have to get it hot to emit. So we used to record, well, even before my time, that we recorded on film, then transition gradually to other types of recording devices. And these would be recorded on what's called a spectrometer, a way of dispersing the light from a source into a pattern like this that can be studied. But now we have lasers. And so that brings us to how would we use a laser to make a measurement? We would take some sort of a laser, and ideally it would be a wavelength tunable laser. So when I say tunable, I mean we could change the wavelength. We pass it through some sort of a combustion environment. It might be a flame. We pass that light onto a detector. We might fix the wavelength, or we might scan the wavelength. But we're going to record the, the individual lines if we can. And these lines do, in fact, have actual shape. So if we were scanning this laser over one line, we might find that the transmission takes a dip and goes up. And then if we apply Beer's law, we can convert that to the absorbance. That's this thing here, which is the first image, and we can see that it actually has shape. We could not see that with a spectrometer. You can't build a spectrometer with enough spectral resolution to actually see this precisely. But with a laser, it's effectively monochromatic. We can study the shapes of lines. And these are functions of pressure and temperature, which means for us, the engineers, that if we have some information on the shape, we can say something about pressure and temperature that's unique, uniquely possible only after we've had a laser. So this is an opportunity for diagnostics. All right, I talked to you about lines, bands, and systems. But now if I talk about spectroscopy, um, uh, the way we're going to, re we're going to re uh, relate this to you is in terms of the positions of the lines, the strengths of the lines, and the shapes of the lines. So the really the three areas of study that we need to understand are the positions of lines. How do we find the positions of lines? How do we calculate or interpret? What are the strengths of those features? And what are the shapes of those features? So I, I break up spectroscopy into these three elements that we have to pay attention to. Now, 
So molecules can reside in uh, any of these allowed quantum states. But in terms of the strength of these transitions, so here's an arbitrary energy level one, arbitrary energy level two, separated by H nu. And now if there's an observed absorbance between one and two, we call that the line strength will typically be denoted by capital S. How strong is it? So remember, we, got, we have positions, strengths, and shapes. Position is set by this energy difference. So if you know the energy difference, you know the wavelength. But we also worry about, well, how strong is this allowed transition? Well, it's going to be related to how many molecules reside in this quantum state. If there's no molecules there, there's no absorption. So the greater the number of molecules in the quantum state, the greater the absorption. So the, this is going to be proportional. The transition strength will be proportional to the number of molecules in that initial energy level uh, one. And that's governed by what's called the Boltzmann distribution. So hopefully, if you've had any course in statistical mechanics or you have to go read about it, there is a well-known science uh, literature on the, uh, on, called statistical mechanics, which tells you that the fractional population of that molecule in level I fraction of, in level i of that species is given by what's called the Boltzmann distribution, where g is called the degeneracy, energy is the energy of the state, t is the temperature, q is the so-called partition function, also called sum over states. So basically, you look at this expression, and so assuming that I know epsilon of i, and assuming I know this g, which is a number, the Boltzmann fraction depends only on one parameter, t. Boltzmann distribution is really the definition of T. If temperature is well defined, there is a fixed fractional population in that quantum state that changes with T. So this is, in fact, the definition of T. If the gas is in equilibrium, all ways of measuring T give us the same answer. But, we, but this is the definition of T. And so in the case where there's some extreme non-equilibrium, we, we may have multiple temperatures. So this also tells us that if we measure the densities in two different quantum states, take the ratio, we've just determined T. That is, in fact, the best way to determine temperature spectroscopically, the ratio of populations in allowed, two allowed quantum states. We could do this by emission or by absorption. OK, I'm going to go through a variety of examples uh, just to for this end of this lecture to give you some examples of why we use, care about this uh, science. Here's an example of a, a cartoon of a scramjet. So I'm interested in aeropropulsion. Um, and so I came up with schemes in which we would take different colors of diode laser light, like in my pointer, uh, different colors, propagate them by fiber, and we would probe different parts of this, um, of this scramjet. We would probe the inlet if we were interested in measuring the amount of mass flux that comes in or the species maybe the shock train location. We might make measurements here in the combustor if we're worried about temperature and species. We might make measurements here if we wanted to look at the unburned fuel, velocity, or the thrust. So conceptually, we could take these lights of controlled wavelengths and, and manipulate them in a way that allows us to measure all of these quantities. And that's what my group has been working on for 20, 30, 40 years. And we've learned over time how to indeed measure all these quantities, temperature, velocity, concentration of the primary combustion products, and so on. We tend to do this in a laboratory, and then some of these ideas would be taken into the field and have been used in various ground test facilities, and one of them has even been used in, 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 in flight. Okay, I'm going to give you a second example. This is an extreme example because it's a high temperature example. So at, uh, in California near Stanford, there's a, a NASA center called Ames, and they have, I believe, the world's largest arc jets, which is an electrical heater to heat uh, gas of interest, expand it into a supersonic flow, and use this for various forms of hypersonic vehicle testing. So basically, they're adding electrical energy to get the enthalpy up high, expand it in this nozzle to get a, a high speed, high temperature uh, jet, which can be used to test bodies or a lot of work goes on testing um, shuttle heat, uh, tiles for heat transfer. This is a big thing. It's, uh, one of them is 60 megawatts. They tend to put it into a big box so that they can shield it off. These orange lines have to do with water. So you can imagine if you're adding 60 megawatts, there's a lot of heat transfer that has to be dealt with. There's a lot of electromagnetic radiation problems, so they put it in a big box. So basically, there is a section here. This is the 
arc section. So there'd be some sort of anode and a cathode, and the current flows along this axial uh, system. Lots of cooling water, typically some cooling with argon, but air is typically what they're interested in, and it's going to pass out of this chamber here at its stagnation enthalpy, expand in this nozzle. This might be, say, six atmospheres, expand into this test cabin. And the idea, and they came to uh, my group maybe the first time was uh, 10, 12 years ago, and they said, we'd like to know what the temperature is here. So how would you f measure the temperature? Thinking that the temperature is probably six to 8,000 degrees Kelvin, how are you going to measure that? You cannot use a thermocouple. You might say, well, we'll do an energy balance. OK, you can do an energy balance, measure the cooling water and so on. It's going to be kind of crude. So they came to us and they said, help us to measure the temperature. Let's make sure that it's steady. And so, and, and by the way, it's um, 7,000 degrees Kelvin. So how are you going to do that? Air at 7,000 degrees Kelvin. What is air at 7,000 degrees Kelvin? It started off being oxygen and nitrogen. But it's not just oxygen molecules and nitrogen at 7,000 degrees Kelvin. So we can take advantage of that complexity, actually. Take a look at this. We are expecting temperatures in this range, pressures in this range. We knew that they were flowing about 2,000 amps. They have two of these things. One is 20, 160 megawatts. And, and the engineers who run these things don't like spectroscopists because we want to drill holes in their, in, their, in their chamber. So they're very particular. So they did not give us good optical access, but we found, you know, eventually we found a way. So when you have oxygen at uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin, the O2 is fully dissociated. There's no longer O2. It's, there's O. And the O is distributed in different electronic energy levels. So the spectrum now that we care about is the electronic spectrum of oxygen atoms. And since we know something from combustion, well, we know all about chemical equilibrium. It's 6,000 degrees. It's two atmospheres. Reaction rates are fast. Let's assume chemical equilibrium. If you assume chemical equilibrium, you can say that the oxygen is dissociated. You can say that the oxygen atoms are distributed by the Boltzmann distribution as a function of T. So if I could measure something about the electronic spectrum of oxygen atoms, I can infer the temperature. So in fact, the ground level absorption of oxygen energy levels here, the first allowed transitions are in the vacuum ultraviolet. So we make a measurement between here and here. We measure the population in this particular quantum state. And we won't get into all this complicated notation. There's a quantum state. All of this is known. That is, the energy levels have been studied for 50 years. Energy levels are known, and we know that there's a strongly allowed transition at 777 nanometers between this quantum state and this quantum state. If I measure by absorption the number in that state, and I know the total number of O because it's, it's uh, given to me by the oxygen that was in the air, fully dissociated, I've just determined temperature. And that's what we did. So we measure now. We scan across the absorption of that individual line, which actually is comprised of four or five Sublines, we won't get into that right now, but this is the shape of that absorbance. And you see the peak value is about 0.5. This integrated area tells me the number density in that quantum state is about 10 to the 10th per cubic centimeter. That's a pretty small number. The density in this room is like 10 to the 19th. We're talking about a very small mole fraction. That's okay. These transitions are very strong. So we can measure the number density in that state, and from that, we can get the temperature of 7,130 degrees Kelvin. So we took the integrated area, the known spectroscopic constants that we need, an assumption of chemical equilibrium, and we get a temperature of 7,000 degrees Kelvin. So that's a pretty amazing thing to do. We've done that up to about uh, 10,000 degrees Kelvin in one example. Higher temperature doesn't hurt us. We just have to change the quantum states that we probe. Here's another example. Hopefully there's another example. OK, maybe this is the same one. This is now just looking at the function of the, the signal of temperature as a function of time. Uh, in another, and this is, we are looking at the transients when they turned off the, uh, the arc. They will run for minutes. They'll run for minutes. Well, here's the case of 80, 800 seconds. And we could measure the transients here. They're also concerned about uh, water leaks and a variety of other things that we've helped them with. They worry about the erosion of the copper uh, cooling lines cooling uh, chamber disks. So we measured copper atoms as a function of time for them to tell them when it was time to, to service their unit. Uh, 
why it's not advancing. Hope we don't have a crisis. Backwards. I'm having trouble with my computer lately. I think this is a problem. Let me see, what can I do? I think there's a way of going to the next, see what this is. Locked up. What shall I do? Presentation. Do you have any computer experts who could tell me what might be happening to my computer? Okay. Oops. Okay. Let's try this again. About, uh, oh, maybe it's going to. Okay. Run presentation. I tried too many different things. Let's see what's going to happen. Huh. I'm afraid to touch anything now until I get through this. Okay, so let's see. I showed you the I showed you the architect. Okay, there's another example that I'm interested in, which is to probe a a pulse detonation combustor, which is a a tube filled with combustible gas. Detonation is induced. It propagates down that tube and then it exit, exits through a nozzle, the nozzle being there to provide some back pressure. And we did these experiments at the Naval Postgraduate School of California. So this, the question was, uh, what are the conditions that are produced by this device, which was going to be used to feed a, a, a gas turbine? So the question is, what is the flux of enthalpy, temperature, and species that's coming through this system? So we outfitted this nozzle where we knew that at the choke point, it was sonic. And we measured water by line of sight absorption and the temperature by looking at ratios of lines. This stands for, this is 1.4 microns, 1.4 microns. We measured CO2, we measured CO in the infrared, so those are 2.7 uh, and 4.8 microns. And from that combination of variables, we can get, and I hope this will advance. Uh, we assume choke flow, which means that it's going to be Mach numbers one at the throat. So if we measure the temperature, we've got the velocity, and we measure the species. And from this, take, this combination of quantities, we can talk about what is the flux of enthalpy, that is the flux of energy flowing through this nozzle, going into the, the, the transient going into the, uh, the gas turbine. want to do that again. <laughs> okay, so the point is it's not cool, so we only, it only runs for a couple of seconds. But the idea is for you to see that's a pretty dynamic transient environment in which we're trying to make measurements. And so now what we'd like to do is we'd like to analyze the data that we've taken there using our, this would be near infrared, 1.4 microns. We use that to measure temperature in water. We measured CO at 4.6 microns. CO. So we know where to make these measurements by virtue of the spectroscopy that we've learned about. Assuming choke flow, we can correspond, make this, uh, convert this into the flux of enthalpy. And now this is a plot, plot of uh, temperature versus time. Uh, the Stanford TDL tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy is the red. The blue is a, some sort of a, a model. Usually these things are very hard to model, so this would be considered good agreement. I don't know why it differs out here. Temperatures are up to like 3,000 degrees Kelvin plus. 30 atmospheres, so this is a pretty hostile environment. And basically, reasonably good agreement during the first part of this blowdown. So now, um, we can then go to the mass flow, which we get by the speed of sound in the, in the throat. And we can combine all that back together. So this is the enthalpy flux. So this is the flux of enthalpy. These units now are megawatts. It's a very transient uh, environment. Intervals are about, uh, I think it was running about 40 or 50 hertz. So this is not really a nice steady flow into this gas turbine. But the concept, which was then in vogue, called the pulse detonation engine, has now been converted to what's called a rotating detonation engine to provide a more steady enthalpy flux. But they're still in need to measure the income 
incoming stream into these combustors. Now, one of my students took our diagnostics of this uh, scramjet concept to, to Germany to make measurements in what's called the HEG in Germany. It's a large shock tunnel. We've developed sensors for a lot of different quantities, but I'm going to just show you an example here. OK. Um, we would develop this at Stanford, use it in the ground test facility, and then consider using it in flight. But I only know of one. It, US has only done one of these, but uh, now I understand this. the Norwegians are trying to do this too. OK, I want to show you now an example of uh, a Mach 7.4 shock tunnel in Germany. If this place, this is now a transient event. That was the experiment. It lasted a few milliseconds. So we had to measure what's happening in a short period of time. Now, why is it so short? Because to produce conditions like this, you can't really do it uh, continuously. The, the enthalpies are too high. So this is called a, 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 a pulse facility. And this is the way that uh, this is a scramjet model, and we make measurements in here. Then so the, the facility is, I don't know, maybe 60 meters long, something like that. And the test section is at the end, and you have to measure within a few milliseconds. So I'm just, we won't go into detail here. We're able to measure pressure versus time, temperature versus time, and they would like this to be steady. There's a gradual increase in the amount of water that's present. So they're fueling this thing with uh, either hydrogen or, or ethylene fuel. And the question is, what is produced by this combustor? And we can measure the velocity also. So our, our sensor is built to give us the temperature, the pressure, the water, and the velocity. Come later to how he actually did all those things. OK, let's see. How am I doing on time? OK, I guess. Um, one more example I'm going to talk about, shock tube kinetics. So we'd like to measure if what's happening here is a function of time after the shock heating. So the shock tube is just a heater. At time zero, the temperature jumps up to 1,500 Kelvin, whatever we want. And we want to see what happens as a function of time when gases uh, undergo chemical change at those conditions. This is a good example. This is an example of uh, methyl formate. This is this complicated molecule that was related to the work we did on uh, biofuels. So it's a representative molecule. So here's the structure of this molecule. And we start with this methyl formate. Here's the methyl on this end, and this is a subformate structure. And we're at 1,400 Kelvin, 1 1.5 atmospheres. What happens to the methyl formate? Well, methyl formate goes away over a time of 500 microseconds. That methyl formate breaks apart to form almost equal parts of CH3OH, that's methanol, and CO. After about 150 microseconds, we see the CO continues to rise. So basically, every time this decomposes, we get CO. But we also get a methanol, and after a while, we also get smaller amounts of formaldehyde and so on. So we wanted to do something like this where we could measure essentially everything you need to measure to be sure we have a chemical kinetic model that's appropriate. And this method accounts for nearly 100% of the oxygen atoms. So there's only so many oxygen atoms available. Where can they be? They've got to be in CO or methanol or formaldehyde or CO2. So by doing this, we're able to track the chemistry of the system. Now, it took a little time to get to this, so that we might spend six months planning the experiment, developing the capability to measure those species, and then doing the experiment. This is really the end of our, my first lecture, so I'll take questions in a minute. My students are mechanical engineers. They come in, like me. I never had any spectroscopy. But you can learn it. It's practical. It's not that hard. It's just notation and rules that you have to learn and follow, and then laboratory procedures. How do we handle these lasers? How do we tune these lasers? How do we measure the transmission? How do we measure the emission? So there's a lot of experimental stuff that we have to learn that goes around the underlying spectroscopy. But what I tried to show you is if you accept a few rules, which we'll be going through in the next several lectures, this is the sort of thing you can do. And the students who are doing this after, say, maybe by the end of their second year, third year, fourth year, they're doing these things. And the student packed up this stuff, took it to Germany, worked there for a week, got those results. Actually, he took two trips. Usually the first trip, something goes wrong. 
and you got to go back and, and fix something. But then by the second trip, it's usually working good enough. Okay. Well, I'm hoping I'm not going to have any more trouble with my computer for the next, uh, next hour. Any questions? So the assumption of equilibrium, we know so much about chemistry. If we know the pressure and the temperature, we can kind of quickly say, it's 6,000 degrees, it's two atmospheres. It's, it's, we have, first of all, it takes, I don't know what the flow time is in that system, but the react, chemical reaction time to achieve equilibrium can be calculated, it would be microseconds. So the flow time is long enough, that's, that's easy. The bigger problems when you're doing absorption are, is it really uniform along the line of sight? The theory that I showed you was based upon the assumption that uh, have properties are uniform along the line. That's usually the biggest limitation that we have. Uh, other times, well, in order to make the quantitative measurements, you have to have temperature. So we usually start with temperature. You have to have temperature usually to get the species. So the assumption of chemical equilibrium uh, in that case was an easy one. If it's not an equilibrium, what do we do? Then you, then you take the ratio of absorption in two lines. Get the long, now I have to retreat and say, it's not chemical equilibrium. But it is in thermal equilibrium, that is, the Boltzmann distribution still reigns. So you have just like a, a series of places where you draw the line to, to, to be able to interpret things. Some questions? Yes? Or the association temperature of molecules from the pressure? No, well, the, the bond energy of the molecule doesn't depend on pressure. But the equilibrium composition of the chemical equilibrium does depend upon pressure. I'm not sure I've answered Question. So we know the energy level structure of these molecules. The question is, what states are they in? That depends on the temperature. So we can measure, we can measure, in fact, we're doing it right now. We're studying the dissociation of oxygen at temperatures up to about 9,000 Kelvin. That's related to hypersonic uh, reentry problems. So actually, the rate coefficients for dissociation of diatomic molecules is really important to, uh, to reentry problems. I'm sure I answered your question very well, but I can, we can talk more later. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, just one more. If you have like such a small concentration of the species, how long would you have if you're probing such a specific transition before you would well start to perturb it off of equilibrium of your laser? Okay. Usually our lasers are really wimpy. Okay. I'd be milliwatts. So, and often it's flowing. So that the sample you're looking at, you're really not examining very long. So one way or the other, Remember, we're using now linear methods. That's in order to activate the nonlinear methods. People typically use high laser energies, pulses, pulse light, and the instantaneous levels can be sufficient to perturb the system. But when you're dealing with absorption, uh, the laser has to be hotter, brighter than the thing you're measuring. But we typically use milliwatts, maybe two, three, five milliwatts. And in most cases, because it's flowing by, the sample that we're heating is not there long enough to absorb enough. But if we're a static cell, low pressure, now, now you have a potential problem. You could be perturbing the system because you're adding energy. So if you absorb light, you're adding energy into the system, and it will grow with time. But in our high temperature, flowing environments, not a problem. Other question? There was another question. There's one. Yes? Okay. What's the highest pressure for uh, TPDAX lasers before the signal gets saturated? Is it the highest pressure or the highest intensity? Uh, pressure. Pressure, I don't think I know. You, are you meaning that uh, because the light would be fully absorbed? That's me. Okay. So uh, remember, it always goes like uh, e to the minus. Uh, we typically use units of uh, SVP chi L. So it always depends upon the path length. So, so the longer the path, the more the absorption. Well, what do you do? If you have too much absorption, you go to a weaker line. It's, so you design the experiment to be successful. Usually the problem is getting enough absorption. Maybe they like, we, we in some cases measure over a path of say five millimeter. Now the path length is so short, we don't have enough absorption. The usual challenge is how do you interpret weak signals? If you have uh, a complete attenuation of light, saturation, that's not a good experiment. We wouldn't do that. We would either tune to a weaker line, which is, because there's so many lines available, to a weaker line, or we would maybe work in the wings of a line. Saturation is not usually a problem, but as problems change, the path changes, the pressure changes, you might choose different transitions to use. 
just like we use specific oxygen transition for that problem I showed you. So because the spectrum, there's so many lines in the spectrum, you have choices. The other problem you run into is, well, maybe you can't buy a laser at the wavelength you want. That's a problem. But gradually over time, that's less a problem. It may be expensive. The first oxygen laser that I had at 760 nanometer cost $12. Now, of course, they're thousands of dollars because that was telecom. The telecom industry made all this stuff dirt cheap. But now, if we want some special wavelength, 10 microns, we might have to pay six, eight, ten thousand dollars per laser. So these dotted lasers are still relatively cheap compared to the exotic laser systems that people have in combustion laboratories. Other questions? Okay, I think we're roughly on time. <laughs>